Bible say about the days ahead. For centuries, people have studied the Bible with their curiosity aroused about future events. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're here for another great study in God's Word. Of the many topics that people request of Dr. McGee's teaching, prophecy is one of the favorites. And today, our study in Isaiah 56 focuses on a prophetic look forward, past this age, into the millennial age to come. I appreciate what Dr. McGee says about the study of prophecy, that it's not to entertain the curious or to intrigue the intellect, but to encourage holy living. Remember, the Apostle John wrote that everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. The study of prophecy gives us a purifying hope. So if you can, open your copy of God's Word to Isaiah 56, beginning at verse 1, and let's commit this time to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing to us the wonderful truths that you've hidden in your scriptures, truths open to the humble of heart, but hidden to the proud. Lord, we're listening when we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now you have found, I'm sure, the fifth or sixth chapter of Isaiah, and we're following along here a pattern that all goes back to that marvelous 53rd chapter, the salvation of the Lord provided for lost mankind by the sacrifice of his son upon the cross. Now he returns here to the nation Israel, and Isaiah the prophet is speaking now to his own people, and in light of that, and in the first eight verses, he gives you some grand particulars of the future kingdom. And then from verses 9 through 12, you see the sorry predicament of the present kingdom. That is, as it was in Isaiah's day, even with Hezekiah on the throne, and he led in revival. Yet the contrast is quite evident here. Now, what we have here is not a retreat to Mount Sinai, as some seem to think, but rather a victory march through the arch of triumph into the millennium. It's a forward movement, which is the logical outworking of what has preceded. It pertains particularly to Israel, radiates out into a widening circle of global benefits. And this all rests upon the new covenant that God has made with Israel, and it will be the blessing for the earth in the future. And at that time, The law, which the Lord Jesus lifted to the nth degree in the Sermon on the Mount, will be enforced on the earth because he'll be reigning, and that will be his will, and it will be his law. And the emphasis, therefore, in this chapter is on ethics and not events. It's upon practice and not prophecy. This is something that, frankly, ought to influence us today because a great many people think the study of prophecy is more or less to entertain us and to satisfy the curious or to intrigue the intellect, but actually it is to encourage holy living. And you remember the writer in the New Testament says that he that hath this hope purifieth himself, so that this is a purifying hope, by the way. Now he's looking on into the kingdom when the Lord Jesus is reigning. And you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he lifted the law to the nth degree there, which makes it absolutely today impossible for anybody to be saved by the law. For instance, he said, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. 
And there are very few of us today that are not murderers on that kind of basis. How are you going to be saved? Well, we have a Savior today that saves us. But when he's raining down here, believe me, there'll be no one hijacking a plane, and you'll be able to walk down Glory Boulevard and Hallelujah Avenue in Jerusalem. And the earth is going to be safe in that day. Every man will dwell in peace under his own vine and fig tree. And that means he's going to be a capitalist. Everybody's going to own his property. And thank the Lord, he'll not have to pay taxes in that day to keep up some crippled school system today where they burn it down periodically and destroy the property. And today, people are being taxed out of their minds as well as their pocketbooks today. And friends, it's something that can't continue. At one time, it precipitated a tea party in this country, and it led to a revolution. And the thing can't continue today. And it's time that politicians are recognizing that. Now, the beauty about the millennium, and there are many beauties, but one of them will be that every man will own his own property and he'll not be taxed. That's going to be great, isn't it? That would be the millennium, by the way. Now, will you listen to him in verse 1? Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Now, the prophets recognized that there would be an interval before the establishment of the kingdom. But they also speak of it in the immediate future. And the salvation spoken of here is the national salvation of Israel. And this was what was in the mind of the apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 11:26. So all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That is anticipation of the coming salvation. And because it was coming, that should be an incentive. You see, just as we've said that if we have the hope of his coming, it's an incentive to live a holy life today. Now he says, blessed is the man that doeth this and the Son of Man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. So you see, this is for a people that are back under the Sabbath, and it will be restored after this day of grace in the millennium here upon the earth. And this will be the time of the millennium. Now, today we're living in a day when we're definitely told let no man judge you in reference to a Sabbath day. But today, we are therefore not under it, which I think ought to be evident to anyone. But that doesn't mean that God does not intend to restore it to the earth when he reigns upon the earth. For the law will go forth from Jerusalem. Verse 3, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. In other words, the Gentile in that day is not to feel he's an outsider because of God's peculiar arrangement with Israel. On the contrary, he's invited to step up and share the blessings. And a eunuch could not serve as a priest under the Mosaic economy. In other words, a physical handicap in that day will shut no one out. Now in verse 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. In other words, the handicapped, the strangers, and all outcasts are invited to accept God's gracious overture of a position that's better than a son or daughter and a security that's everlasting. Now, the law, of course, could not afford, nor did it give that. This, you see, is lifted now to the nth degree. This is the millennium we're talking about. Verse 6, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath 
from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. You see, the stranger will be given a new heart that he might love the Lord in that day. And then verse 7, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now, this is a verse from which the Lord quoted when he cleansed the temple the second time. It was God's original intention that the temple was to be for all peoples, irrespective of their race, tongue, class, or condition. And it had long ceased to function as such in Christ's day. Now, the church today is far removed from its primary objective, just as the temple is. The church today has become sort of a suburban country club. And you find that the church has been running from people, either that or chasing them, and not with the thought of winning them to Christ today. But they left the downtown area, went out to the suburban area, and they become there a place that they have generally a good kitchen and serve a good meal. They have a good volleyball team and they have a good basketball team, but they don't have very many personal workers that are out winning the loss to the Lord. Now will you notice verse 8, the Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. Now the kingdom is to be worldwide in this extent, and it will include members of every family of the human race, and God says in that day they're going to go out after them. I think the greatest time of what we'd call revival, that is turning to Christ, will take place in the millennium. Now here in verse 9, we begin this second and last section. Now the first part, what a marvelous view of the future kingdom. But what about the predicament of the present kingdom as it was? And you can look around you today. Now here is what Isaiah says, verse 9, All the beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all the beasts in the forest. Now our vision is shifted from the lofty contemplation of the glorious future kingdom to the sorry condition of the then existing kingdom. God was permitting the nations of the world to come in like wild and ferocious beasts, and they were robbing and pillaging his people. Assyria had already broken in, Babylon was soon to break in, and others would come to plunder and destroy. Many of you have seen my pictures on Jerusalem, and you can't look at those pictures without noticing the stones and the walls of Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, there at the pinnacle of the temple. And it's quite evident that that city has been destroyed at least 27 times. And it's built today upon a debris that if you got down to the time of Christ, you'd probably go down 30 to 50 feet below the present surface. God permitted that to happen. Why? Because they had failed him so. Now, verse 10 is a remarkable verse. His watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Now, this is a picture, actually, of the prophets and the priests and those who spoke for God in that day. They were watchmen. They were blind, and they were ignorant, and they were dumb dogs. You remember Paul said, beware of dogs, and that's not, you know, to give to the male man to tell him to beware of dog where he delivers mail, or to beware of a dog when you visit a stranger sometime and one comes out barking at you. What he's talking about here, that every shepherd had a dog to help him watch the sheep, and the dog would be the one to lie down but keep an eye open. And the minute that an uh, animal came near or a human being to harm the sheep or to steal him, the dog would begin to bark. But now the watchman, the prophet, who should be warning God's people, who should be giving out the Word of God. Well, they were ignorant of it, and they were just dumb dogs. They found it's easier to keep quiet and not say anything. Liberalism, to my judgment, 
came in because of the cowardly position that ministers took. When you preach the Word of God, you step on toes. I know that. I've been doing it for years, and I don't apologize for it. I try to be as nice and sweet as I can, but my friend, the Word of God is strong, and right here it's very strong. He talks about that a man that stands in the pulpit that won't give out the Word of God is a dumb dog, my friend. And I didn't say that. Don't accuse me of that. Isaiah said that. You take it up with Isaiah and the Holy Spirit and see what they have to say. But I don't think they'll change it. Dumb dogs, he says. And by the way, I think this is where the DD degree originated. Dumb dog degree. A man that won't give out the Word of God. Sleeping, lying down, can't bark, loving to slumber. Well, it's much more comfortable. You'd be pastor of a people. The idea is to please them all. We here today, I have had several letters from folk that said, would you recommend to us a pastor? And then they give the qualification. And do you know what is top priority today? We want one with a good personality that knows how to communicate to all age groups that the senior citizens are loving and the young people are loving and actually, some of these didn't even emphasize the question whether he could teach the Word of God or not. And as a result, we got a lot of dumb dogs around today. I'm sorry to have to say it, but Isaiah said it before I ever thought of it. In fact, I never even thought of it. Now, verse 11, yea, they're greedy dogs. A lot of them are greedy, by the way, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand they all look to their own, every one for his gain, for his quarter. In other words, what does this mean to me personally? And the important thing is not to give out the Word of God. A preacher friend of mine who's retired, he and I the other day had lunch, and he said to me, McGee, you're making it very strong on radio. Suppose that people turn against you and won't support your program. I said, I'll go off the air and just tell the Lord about it. He intends two things. If he intends for me to stay on the air, he intends for me to give out his word. And that's his problem. And I'll be very frank with you. I think that's his problem, not mine, because he wants me to give out the word. Now, if he doesn't raise up friends, I won't have any, but I'm going to give out the word, friends. Now, notice, he says, verse 12, come ye, say they, I will fetch wine and we will fill ourselves with strong drink and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. Well, these people drown their sad plight and their condition in drink, and they face the future as drunkards and blind optimists. And there are great many people today that are facing life like that. They are drowning their troubles in drink today. And this nation of ours, my friends, we talk about the drug problem of the youth what about the drunken problem, the alcohol problem of the adult today? I am on planes, I'm in motels, I'm in public places. I have never in my day seen as many people that drink. I was on a plane the other day, and there was a dear little grandmother on there. She was the sweetest looking little thing. I just wish she'd been my grandmother. And this dear little lady, I thought, man, she won't have a cocktail. <laughs> Do you know that that girl, I heard her order, she ordered a Bloody Mary. Oh, boy, did she put them down. That old girl was accustomed to that sort of thing. And I thought, my, the morality of this nation, my friend, has gone out. And a great many Christians just like to hear some sweet, soft music. And today, there are a great many so-called Christian radio stations. They major in music. Why? Because you don't get in trouble if you play music. But you give out the Word of God, you do, my friend. Because Isaiah is saying some very strong things here. And I wish he'd cool it, by the way, because he may get me in trouble. Now, we move on, friends, here to the 57th chapter. We are coming now to the approaching end of the age. And when you come to the end of the age, it means comfort for the righteous and condemnation for the wicked. Now today, I must grant you that the wicked are having it easy, and they are the ones in comfort. They are the ones with the money. 
They are the ones that seem to be on top. But when you get to the end of the age, it means comfort for the righteous and condemnation for the wicked. Now, this is God's order. Now we have here, this chapter here will mark the end of this second section of the final division of Isaiah. This section brings us to a conclusion, and this section we've labeled the salvation of Jehovah, which comes through the suffering servant. Now, this will end it. And those who will come, though, in humility and accept it are made righteous. Those who reject it, they proceed on their wicked way to judgment. Now, this chapter brings us to the crossroads where the way that leads to life goes one way and the broad way to destruction goes another way. The destination and division are right here. Now, the next section will be labeled the glory of Jehovah, which comes through the suffering servant. Now, that section introduces us to the kingdom. This chapter brings us to the final scene before the coming of the kingdom. Now, we have here in the first 14 verses the contrast between righteous and wicked. Listen to this. The righteous perish it, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Now, a great many people think today, my, why does God take some of his wonderful saints away today through the doorway of death? Well, my friend, he's removing them from a lot of trouble that's coming ahead. And in fact, when I started in the ministry, I worried about myself. Then when I had a child, I worried about her. Now I've got a grandson. I'm worried about his future. I don't worry about mine or even my daughter's, but I do worry about that little fella because he's going to have it rough out yonder in the future. Now God is removing some of his choicest saints from the scene even today, and he'll continue it right down to the end. Verse 2, he shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. But now notice, but draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Now God addresses the wicked, even their ancestors bad. Note the label that he gives their mothers, and it's not nice. Verse 4, against whom do ye sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Now, they've been persecutors of the righteous. And up to this point, God has not intervened. You look around you today. You see the attack made upon the righteous. They're not having it easy, friends. The attack is coming hard and fierce today. But the wicked, they seem to get by with it. Now, he says here, verse 5, "...inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks." Now, they were idolaters. They turned their backs on God, and they're guilty of gross immorality and murder. Those are the two sins today, adultery and murder, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That is the condition of the wicked at the present time. And this, my friend, speaks of a day that's yet future. Well, we'll leave off right there and pick up at verse 6 next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. If the increasing influence of evil permeating every corner of our society is a concern to you, and if you'd like to know more about what the Bible has to say about it, then I suggest you check out Dr. McGee's free booklet download titled, What Is This World Coming To? And then I'd also suggest our booklet, Rest Assured, Conquering Your Doubts About Your Salvation. If you've ever doubted God's gift of salvation, this message is just for you. You can download both of these booklets and look through more than the 100 other titles by Dr. McGee when you visit the resources section at ttb.org and click on the free booklets link. And while you're visiting, why don't you check out the many other resources that we offer that we think will help deepen your study of God's Word, including our Bible Bus flash drive. If you're looking to have all of Dr. McGee's five-year audio messages available at your fingertips, this little 8-gigabyte drive is just for you. And to aid in your study, it also contains Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for every book of the Bible and most of his booklets. To find out more about this handy Bible study tool, visit ttb.org and click Store, or just call us 
at 1-800-65-BIBLE. As Frank in Alabama says, I found your ministry a couple of years ago on our local radio station soon after I started using your Android app to download daily to listen on the way to work. I also purchased your flash drive. I'm so grateful for these tools that will help me go through the five-year teaching in one year. I'm certain that doing this one time will not be enough to absorb it all, so I will do it again. I love the teaching and Dr. McGee. I wish I could have met him. His doctrine is so sound. Keep up the great work. Well, thanks, Frank, for your review. So, again, if you'd like to learn more about the flash drive and then the many other ways that Dr. McGee's teaching is available to you, then you need to visit us at ttb.org and check out our online store or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. We've got more in this terrific study of Isaiah tomorrow. I hope that you'll hop aboard the Bible bus and join us. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you there. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.